Okay, uh, I'm gonna say hi to everybody that's here and welcome. And I'm gonna say hi to everybody that's uh, joining us by Zoom. Uh, I appreciate everybody coming out. We're gonna have some fun. We're gonna talk today. I'm Christopher Runsman. I sign my work Run C Man because it's the easiest way I can get people to figure out how to pronounce my last name. Um, but uh, I've been writing and illustrating stories for quite a few years. And one of the things that I do on a regular basis, for those that are tuning in by Zoom, many of them might know this, is that every day from 2 to 4 o'clock, um, Monday through Friday, weekends I don't do it in camera, but I still do the same idea you know, on weekends. But Monday through Friday, I draw a one-page story live. And I do so from suggestions and ideas that I get from people. And I write them down in the book of tricks. And all this is, is just pages and pages of suggested random ideas that I get from folks. I'm just dropping paper notes out. So with that, you know, I try to use different materials. I try to use different approaches. I try to lay the pages out in different ways. For me, it's all about exploring storytelling. And I'm on page 311, I think of this year so far. So I'm trying to get 356. I haven't done the math to see if I'll actually reach that or not, but I think I will. Um, and if not, I'll do my best to try to. Um, so one of the things that I've brought in to show people is this cart that I have that's full of all kinds of different mark making material, different art material that I have in my studio to draw upon in a moment's notice and including things like elliptical stencils and circle stencils and different types of paper. And uh, I've got examples on the table for people to see, but it's things like, this is called uh, Smack and Dragon, and it's where you take some ink or some watercolor or something, you put it on a sheet of plastic, you smack it on a piece of paper and drag it across. And it modulates the surface of the paper and just leaves this splotchy mess. But this splotchy mess for me is something that I can start working on. And there's a number of other examples. This is um, what's called jelly plating. It's where you put acrylic paint on a sheet, uh, sheet of gelatin. And then you can put magazine articles and stuff like that and emboss out images from those. And then you lay a sheet of paper over top, let it set and draw it away and it picks up all of that acrylic. And when I get unsuccessful ones that I've done because it hasn't picked up the stuff, that's fine by me as well because I'll still make stories on those. Other ones you'll see words pick up a little more clearly and things like that. But all of these different examples, this is just paint rolled on with a brayer. All these different examples of paper that I'm showing you are just fun surfaces to try things on and to tell stories over top because the surface itself doesn't matter. And I'm going to get a little more into that on the art end of things because it's all about the story that we're trying to draw. And in that exploration of story, using whatever surface that we come across, it just sort of frees up our thinking to stop being too hung up on, well, I've got to sit down and I want to draw the perfect line or I want to try to illustrate whatever set image or how do I start. The paper's already started, let's get going. You know, even if it's a flat color piece of paper, it's the same principle. Just start making marks and before you know it, you'll find your way. This is, uh, one of my grandkids did this uh, for me. It's a bunch of stencils that she's just splotched paint on. Here, wrap a draw on that. Oh, okay. You know, we'll give that a try. This is a more successful jelly plate where you can see an astronaut in there. Now, I don't even know if I'll use this to draw a story that involves an astronaut, but it's just something fun to, to choose from. For those that are in the space, I've got a bunch of examples that at any time you're free to walk up and take a look through. There are examples of the pages that I do work on and, uh, and the, different, the different approaches, and different mediums that I use, you know, and just creating these images in order to produce single pages to go on to the website, you know. But then some of these I figure out that if I do the panels in a certain order, when I put the text on them, 
I can now print them out on a piece of paper that folds up into a little booklet. And so now I've got some handy dandy fun to hang out, or hand out, I'm sorry. This is examples of some of the finished pages that we've done with the suggestions underneath. And so it's just a thing we do on a regular basis. I've got different samples of paper for people in house to take a look through, I have different card stocks and stuff you can try. And then this is a project that we do every month here at TAP, the Center for Creativity here in London, where every third Monday, a bunch of us get together here in, this, in the gallery space, and we, write and, we, and we write and we illustrate comics together. Somebody draws the first panel, slides the page in the middle of the table, somebody takes it, draws the next panel. Continuing that narrative, slides it into the middle of the table. So as writers and artists, it forces us to grow and evolve and try out things that we might not normally do. All these little examples that I'm showing you, whether it's approaching different story, whether it's approaching different mediums and, and mark making tools and stuff that we can use, or whether it's a pro, uh, different finishes and different styles, all of these different examples is just about embracing the idea of creativity in a daily life. It's just about opening yourself up to the possibilities of ideas, you know, uh, materials that you might want to give a try, drawing with a stick in the mud on the beach. There's fantastic exploration you can do with that. I've got a Vonnegut quote, pardon me, a Kurt Vonnegut quote that I really like. Um, Practicing an art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow, for heaven's sakes. Sing in the shower, dance to the radio, tell us stories, write a poem to your friend, even a lousy poem. Do as well as you possibly can, you'll get an enormous reward, and you'll have created something. I really like that principle. I really like that idea. So I'm a huge advocate of that sort of creativity in your daily life. Just something. Find some way of expression. Because language is hard. Writing is hard. Communicating at times can be very hard. And if we can find different means for us to feel that we're expressing ourselves out to the world, why not try it? So one of the things that we're going to try today is I've got this board here with the paper on it. And I've got some, some people that are going to be cajoled into joining in with me here in the space. And if there are people in the webinar that want to suggest ideas on the way, I think we can access those. Yeah, so uh, feel free to participate, to make any comments. Josh is here with me, and he's going to uh, interject some ideas and some thoughts along the way. So those of you that are watching in the webinar can feel free to pay, uh, take part in that regard. Uh, OK, so before we get started, I've got paint markers, uh, water-based markers. I've got open paint brushes that have a water reservoir inside of them for doing watercolor or ink work with. I've got regular brushes, regular water, lots of brushes. There's watercolors, there's different mediums, there's pencil crayons, there's stamps, there's inks. I, uh, there's some snacks. I, <laughs> <laughs> I try to have a smattering of anything around me. And in these easy access trays that you see here, this is a fun thing. My good friends bought me this. It actually is an art easel, this little box, so that I can put a little piece on it but it actually holds all your pens. And so I try to keep as many things in there as I can. I've even got fun pens, you know. But the thing with all these materials is that like, we can utilize anything to tell our story, OK? So I thought, I don't know, I've got this open. We'll just grab something out of here. Let's charcoal. Why not? It's in front of us. I've got some charcoal. I've got some, some Conte. Let's start with that, what shall we? So first off, what we're going to do is this. Because I'm open to any ideas, because I'm open to the engagement with others, because one of the things about the engagement with others is that not only does it draw you in with the process and encourages you to take part, but it also allows me to have to engage with things that I might not normally do. You know, So because of that, somebody says, well, draw a platypus and like, what does a platypus look like? You know, 
So I have to figure out how to draw a platypus, which draw a spaceship. What kind of spaceship? You know, and I have to put a spaceship in this story. And so because of that, creatively, as, a, as an illustrator, creatively as a writer, I have to now figure out how to fit this into the story itself. The story can be broken down really easily into four points, right? You've got what's called the context, which is the narrative element. You've got your, your principal character, you've got your, your world or your principal scene. In this case, let's say Bob wants to have a drink of milk out of the fridge. There's no milk in the fridge. So that's a context and our principal character. So I'll usually introduce those story points as soon as I can into whatever the piece that I'm doing today is. Whether it's just the first panel or I step into it over a couple of panels organically. Um, but the next part is the conflict. This is one of the reasons that I said when we started publishing through the comic company my wife and I have, when we started publishing other people, I said, give me four page shorts. Because a four page short breaks down really nicely in the method that I'm showing you. The conflict is whatever the issue is in the story. And in this case, there's no milk in the fridge. Bob goes to the fridge, wants a drink, there's no milk, right? So then we get into, it's the content leading up to the climax, okay? And so Bob's going to the store. Now along the way to the store, there can be a earth-shattering invasion from Mars. Uh, Bob could ride to the store on a cow. It, those parts don't matter. The whole idea of it is that, open, that openness, that open-ended structure allows you to play with any notions that you want within the body of the piece. And then the finality of it is its conclusion. So those four different points is generally why I've said four pages to people when they're putting stuff into our anthologies. Because you can break a story down nicely into four pages. Or you can set down the uh, same story nicely into four, if you look at it as four panels. Now, I'm not adherent to a set structure. I'm a big fan of you trying different methods for telling a page. Now, a normal comic story, which is the balloon on, under which my work is, is associated, a traditional comic story is done in what's called a portrait style of page, where the, where the story moves across in this sort of pattern, whether it's little squares, or if it's a big image in this situational stuff that's going on in the, in the panel happens in a large image or a bunch of little squares or whatever it is. I do things in a landscape format. And the reason that I do that, it's literally just turning the page on its side. But the reason that I do it in that way is one, it's because I don't feel like I have to work within the confines of the established form. And two, because we're, there's generations of people growing up with motion pictures television, video games. And all of those things are in a landscape format. So story, visually, is starting to change. You know, and when we see pieces exhibited in galleries, as much as you'll see large pieces that are in a rectangular shape or an upright portrait style shape, oftentimes you'll see many of them in the landscape format. You know, so it's, it's also, you can look at it as horizontal and vertical if that makes more sense to you. But with this direction in our, in our, in our choices now for how we're going to work, again, I'm, I tend not to be rigidly adherent to format. And so if you want to tell a story that has three vertical panels and you have to tell your story across those panels, then why not do so? If you've got a page where you're going to do two rows of equal size panels, then feel free to do so. You know, your eye will move like that. All of these different methods, how are you doing? All these different methods and approaches that we're going to use over the course of all the different stories that we're trying to tell just allows us to lean maybe a little bit more into 
whatever idea is, whatever that structure is, whatever the means, it's just another means of conveyance by which we're trying to tell our story and another mood that could be set by having a big open page of explosions, you know, or a big action scene running across it. But the second part of it isn't just the visual. The second part of telling a story, because if I can just draw, I'm not fulfilling my obligation, I'm not fulfilling the job. Drawing is only half of it for the type of storytelling that I do. The other half of it is, is, is writing. It's, it's storytelling, it's text. And it's engaging the viewer to also be a reader. Not only are they reading the images with their eyes, and hopefully I'm telling a story that way, but they're also reading the page and the text balloons with their eyes as well. So it's twofold. It works on multiple levels. And, and of course, the third level is the combination of the two. You don't have to draw, you know, somebody, in the case of Bob, Bob goes to the fridge and there's no milk, right? We don't have to draw a picture of Bob holding the milk container upside down like this because we've got a picture of Bob looking into the refrigerator and textually we say, there's no milk in here. So we've crossed that gap. We've made that fusion of words and pictures. So because it's either we show it with the picture or we show it with the text. But you don't have to do both. So it allows you to either expand your storytelling or really tighten it up editorially. Okay? So there's no milk. Bob goes to the store. Along the way, there's, he's forced to ride a cow and there's a Martian invasion. When he gets to the store, Bob forgot his wallet, so he's going to have to turn around and go back home and get his wallet and do this all over again because he still can't buy any milk. So there's a brief example, a rather silly one, but it's a brief, ex a brief example of a story. Does this make sense? Okay? Yeah? All right. So what we can do now, excuse my back to you for a moment. But what we can do now is take a new sheet of paper and I'm going to ask those that are here to suggest an idea, a thought, a character. We're going to build a page. We're going to tell a story together. Now, for, you know, for the interest of the camera, I'm going to do it in portrait style today, even though I said I normally draw in landscape. So does anybody have a character in mind? Feel free to put your hand up. Let me have it. What do you got for me, Austin? A you got a, a what? A jelly bean. Jelly bean? A jelly bean. Okay. A jelly bean. Okay, good. So we've got our first character. Does anybody have a context? Like, does anybody have, where is the jelly bean? Or what is the jelly bean doing? Does anybody have any ideas? Anybody lost else? In the back of the car. A jelly bean lost in the back of a car. Yeah, okay. Excellent. Okay, so right there, two points. We've got a jelly bean, and I hope that my writing is somewhat legible for people. Lost in the back of a car. Can you see that while I'm, yes? Okay. So then what we just, we start doing is immediately off the hop, let's introduce our character, you know, and we'll draw our jelly bean Now, do we want him to have a face? Do we want him to be anthropomorphic? Do we want him to yeah. face hands, feet? Yeah? yeah? A couple of feet, too? All right, so we can put our guy. We can forlorn as he lies here with his little hands and his little feet. Now, so we've got our jelly bean, but we need to place him in that context. We need to put him in that scene. So if we think about, and this is the part, there's two different things that you can approach this from. You can either use your phone, use some books, use some photographs, use some magazine clippings that you've collected, whatever it is. But if you use resource material, there's nothing to say that there's anything. Nobody has any right to tell you that's wrong. Whatever you want to use in order to draw your images from, go for it. Okay, 
Another thing I'm, I'm, I'm a you know, big proponent of is consider when you look at things, I want you to realize everything you see can be drawn with a square, a triangle, and a circle. When you engage in this, it's kind of a mind blower, so I'm going to apologize to some of you right now. The rest of you is, have fun, right? So when you look at any objects around you, you'll realize that we can break those down in these components. And that includes trees, that includes any different objects that you see out in the world. If you look at a, uh, a tree trunk lying on the ground, if you think of it as a rectangle, well, there's some liberty in that. But you can cut a shape out of it like so. You can cut another half circle out of the bottom of it. You can realize that these are all just skinny little rectangles spaced out along it. You know, here's a triangular shape that I'm adding a square to for an arm that comes off of that. We know if we look down from the top that this tree trunk is going to look like this because it's going to be circular at the top. But we know that inside of our heads because we can visually remember what a tree trunk looks like. So when we allow ourselves the opportunity to use these different shapes to draw our tree trunk in, just using triangular shapes, circular shapes, and square shapes, stretched out. Explore it, it's a lot of fun. Okay, so with this in mind, I'm going to try to draw in my memory of what uh, the back of a car is. It's the back of a car, yes? Lost the back of a car, okay. So I want to think about the seats and as they're, and we've got the, the seats for the back of the car, but one of the ways that we can make it a car is if we have, let's do a belt buckle. Okay, sticking out from between the cushions. Okay, so we know we've got our jelly bean in the back of the car, all right? Now, before we put any text in this, where are we going next with it? Jelly bean lost in the back of a car. I'm gonna have some fun while we go, guys. I hope you don't mind. What I mean by that is I'm gonna use different, different tools and different colors and here's a good guy. And let's just, you know, give it some depth as we go. Okay, so, jelly bean locked in the back of a car, lost in the back of a car. Has anybody got any suggestion of what we can do contextually with that next? Okay, so now there's two ways we can do this. We can start to draw him sweating, okay? Or we can have him actually just state, man, it's hot in here. Okay? So we'll think about that for a second. What's next? What's going to happen next? Excellent. Okay. So let's, let's, so let's condense ourselves down. Give me one sec. I'll be right back with you for the next part. Okay. So, you know. So. It's too hot in here for me. And we put an elliptical bubble around it, a little divot going down to where he is. So then now the theory is that he's saying this out loud. Okay? If we have this shape as little circular bubbles going down, there's like a little subversive language that is in sequential media that that means he's thinking it. Bubbles is thinking, hash all, all the way up to the mouth is saying. It's too hot in here for me, okay? And then uh, we can have the door. So let's, let's open to a, a wider shot. So we'll put the seat in front, okay? And we've got our back seat now, and here's the seat that he's sitting on. And then here's the back window of our car, all right? And here on the seat that we have our jelly bean, we'll put the dog at the window. So we start into this hole, the dog's gonna come in the back seat of the car. Okay, so by drawing it in this way, 
and just figuring out our composition first. And then we can put these different visual elements that we started in here, the leather pattern of the, of the chairs, okay? And then we'll do the same for back here. And hopefully that tells our reader this environment here with this pattern is here and then it can figure out that that's our jelly bean. All right, so at the window, We'll have crazy dog pause on the window because the dog knows that they're going for a ride. The dog's very excited. Okay, so then we can have our jelly bean say something in response to the situation he's in. Anybody have an idea? Uh oh, go with that. Straight on. Uh-oh. Okay. Well. So hopefully there's enough, we've got enough representation of the environment for people to understand that that's a back, that's a car. That's the inside of a car. Okay. So there's our uh-oh moment. And then we can do another panel where we can either do a close up on the dog, you know, along the window, looking its tongue across it, whatever it is. There's a million openings for us because we're examining a moment. Because that's all storytelling really is, is examining a moment. Now, whether it's fantastic fiction or whether it's fantastic truth and reality, it doesn't matter. It's entirely made up of moments. You know, you could, you could have an election, an Amer you know, of the American politicians on the podiums talking to the audience and then both of them are beamed up in a UFO. Is it real? Well, it's real in your story and it's just about telling the story, okay? So we can take little sidetracks of having a dog just lick its tongue slowly across the window. Now, if you were to animate that, that's a, there's a dramatic moment in that. But because we're only using a piece of paper to tell our story, we have to figure out methods in order to tell that rhythm with our simple mark making tools. What was your idea? Oh, yeah, I was going to mention that because it's hot, it's really easy, it's sticky. Okay. Okay, let's go with that. So, so we can tighten up here on, well, let's, let's, let's keep our page like this so that I can use the environment around us for any little examples or any little ideas. So, so we can do a tightened up panel right here of his face where he's got, you know, the same expression, but we'll give him some stern eyes on his face where he can now say, you know, I'm way too hot and sticky for this. Okay, and then of course we'll make sure that we continue this visual identifier that we've got through our other panels. Okay, what are we, where are we going next? Anybody have any thoughts or ideas? Ask, let's get, anybody else wanna, wanna one, I'll come back to you in one sec. Anybody that hasn't suggested anything? Any ideas? Okay, what do you got Austin? The dog is gonna eat him. Well, the dog eat him. Remember the four points we talked about? We've got our character and the context that he's in. So we've established that. We've got a conflict that's uh, identifiably established because there's a dog outside the car. And then, but in, so we've got our conflict is established, but we've still got some space to explore, right? On our page. So if we jump right to the dog just gobbling him up, that's a, that's a very short story. It's a very short moment. That works too. That works too. Okay, so let's step it down though. So let's, let's call, Alfred Hitchcock called it raising tension. 
in film, animation, television, it's sequential media. It's, all it is is taking moment to moment to moment to the moment, no different than telling, pic uh, telling picture and writing stories on a piece of paper. It's the same kind of uh, occurrence of image to image to image to image. Now they have sound and speaking, you know, in the films, whereas we have text and what's called onomatopoeia, like boop. Well, if a dog makes a boop sound, you know, that's a dog barking, just from association. But we want to build up to the moment. Alfred Hitchcock said, if you, you know, if you show two people, you know how Alfred Hitchcock used to talk, you know, Ali, Alfred, anyways. So if you show two people sitting in a diner, okay, and uh, one of them sets, sets down the bomb and says, this is a bomb, and puts it right here and we have a conversation. Well, you know there's a bomb and they know there's a bomb. So there's no real tension. You're kind of like, when's the bomb gonna go off? It, but it doesn't drive you in any way. But if you show a suitcase underneath this diner booth that they're sitting in, and these guys are talking, and the camera keeps touching back to the suitcase and showing the timer ticking towards when it's gonna blow up, we as an audience look at that and go, oh, I'm getting invested in the story. I wanna see what's gonna happen. And so we wanna to try to play with ideas like that whenever we're telling our stories. I'm way too hot and sticky for this, so we can cut back to a shot of that dog you know, where we've got his, his nose and he's got his ear flumping in the wind again this way now. Okay, and his tongue is just sliding across the window. Which is, it's gross. I know it's gross, but it's a dog. And it's a dog from the jelly beans perspective. You know, it's just, and we draw big letters around the dog. Bork. Now that would be behind the ear. Bork, you know. And the dog's just right in there like Flynn. But because the jelly bean's looking up at this, it raises the stakes. And we can raise them a little bit further by having somebody say off panel, all right? Just, what's the name of the dog? Anybody? Steven? Is that with a V or a PH? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it with a PH. Is that with an A or an E? Oh, I don't even know. So here's the owner saying off panel, just a second, Stefan, I'm coming. It's not talking to Jelly Bean, it's talking to the dog. Okay, so now we've got heightened stakes. So one of the things that we could do next is tighten down and engage in the action of the door opening before Jelly Bean has to deal with the outcome of a dog rushing upon him, right? So is there any ideas of where we can, where we can step next? Great. That's great. See, that's, that's you can have all kinds of things. You can have the dog going and he's on as he's on a lead being taken this way and he's barking back towards the car because he knows that there is a yummy snack inside that car. But what it is, is it's a nice turn and it changes the expectation for the viewers. Now, there's a lot of talk about uh, altering expectations or deferring expectations in, in film and stuff today, which makes some really bad endings for movies and doesn't turn stories in weird ways. But when we're telling stories, it's no different than it is like a joke, right? If, uh, if somebody says a skeleton walks into uh, a place to get a drink and then somebody goes inside of their mind as they hear this thing, they're kind of expecting where the joke's gonna go. Can a skeleton have a drink? 
what happens when it puts water to its mouth? It goes right through it. So we sort of have an expectation of where it's going to go. But if you say a skeleton goes into a place to get a drink, he asks the person that he's going to get a drink from if he can have you know, a bucket and a mop. So he knows it's going to go through him, and he has something to clean it up. So it, it breaks the form. It changes it from being what you expect from the joke to add an element to it. So that's exactly what this does here. So if we have the owner, if we have the dog carrying on, now I'm drawing the most random shaped dog on the planet Earth, but so is that we've got the dog carrying on with his tongue hanging out and his paws moving forward and this little prancing motif where his hind section is behind him and he's doing that dancing around. And because we're just laying this out, we're just throwing down the marks, but you know, how you doing? We'll just, we'll draw it a little more sophisticated as we go. But if we have the owner standing beside the dog, we don't have to draw the entire person. We suggest the person. We suggest, you know that there's an entire person at the end of this where he says, uh, hold on, Stephen. And so if we draw the side of the car right here, with the windows, and he says, uh, you want to go for a car ride? And then we have the word balloon, again, going up and off, the same as we have here. Now, there's little sneaky things that we can do. Because we've got this balloon going this way with the word balloons going off, when we have the text moving up and off again to be directed towards where the guy's mouth is, it sort of subconsciously makes you realize that it's the same person saying the same thing, like saying these different things. Anyways, so he says, uh, so he'll clip onto the dog. I know I really should look at a picture of a dog. And we'll draw his ears down. So he'll clip a lead onto the dog, or a, what do you call that? Uh, is it a lead where you've got your dogs on when you're taking a dog? I don't own a dog when you have a, yeah? So we, we'll have the, the farmer person leaning over, I have his knee up here. put down like so, but we still got him off panel because he doesn't matter. What matters is the arrangement between the dog and the jelly bean. That's why I haven't drawn the dog's owner in so much because it's just another character. It helps your audience to be able to identify a little more if you don't specifically make a character represent something. So in this case, it's just dog owner. It just happens to be a male, but it's just dog owner. Okay, so well, it's a guy with a mustache. Oh, it's a mustache dog owner story, is it? You know. So I have the dog, his pop. As he stands here, getting his lead put on him. And he says, "What was it? You said let's go for a walk instead." Excellent. I want to check where we are for time. Okay, a couple more minutes. So, so then it leaves us with a couple of different directions that we can take. But do we like the idea of the dog desperately wants still in that car and then the moment from the jelly bean? Does that sound good or has anybody got a zinger they want to hit me with? You see is I'll go, oh, zinger. Come on, zinger, where are you? Let's do that. So. As, so as our owner now steps away and says, come on, Stephen. And they're, so they start to walk away now and they've got their dog. So here's their hand and there's the lead. And we'll have 
Stephen doing his best to walk backwards, right? So as he's got, I'm trying to think of what the dog would do. You know, he'll pull back. Sit down, won't he? Isn't that what dogs do? When they don't want to walk and you're trying to get them to walk and they'll sit down, and, you know, one of those actions. And so he says, all right. So he'll say, all right, let's go. Word balloon, off we go. And so here's like, we'll give him a whining sound. And then we can cut back to our jelly bean in the back seat of our car. Well, let's close his eyes like this and have him say, with his hands and his little feet. He's got feet. Why didn't he run? Oh, here we go. And then, woo. Thank goodness. Now, this is a silly story, but it's a story. It's the examination of a moment. It's taking these different ideas, however contrived they are, however disconnected that they might be, and putting it together into some kind of a storytelling structure in which the reader looks at a narrative and they get the four points that I, I, I started talking about at the beginning. Okay, we've got our character and our context, we've got the conflict going on, we've got all of those situations that come along in the content of the story leading up to the, con the climax right here, and then there's our conclusion. You can do it with a page, you can do it with a 30-page book, you can do it with a 200-page book. You can have a 200-page book of a whole bunch of these little incidents along the way, but as long as we have some sort of governing structure, the rest of it's free form and do whatever you like and explore story. So that's about it for me today, okay? I just wanted to walk through this example with everybody. I just want to encourage you on every level. The reason I brought in so many tools and things to show you, it's not with the expectation that I'm using everything, it's just to sort of illustrate, you can do, you can use anything. Any kind of mark making material, find a charcoal pencil and scribble on a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can refine it. You can go back over it again and refine it over time or put it in a drawer because you've got the idea, whether textually or like, you know, or, or, is, or visually, put down on paper, put it aside in a drawer and explore it again in a year. Maybe in a year, year's time because you've been practicing or whatever, there's a little more sophistication in your abilities and you can enhance on this. But it's just exploring creativity on a daily basis. And if you can do it in engaging with other people, pure fun. So yeah, so the, uh, Every month we get together and we do the comic jam here. It's something that we do to, to, to play around with the idea of, of exploring story together, stepping outside of our narrative. There's all kinds of other opportunities and things like that. You know, in all kinds of different locations, in different cities, wherever you are, I'm sure there's different, different approaches. Writers workshops where they work together off the same suggested motif and everybody's got to write a, small, a short piece from that. Explore through poetry, through a script, through whatever it is, you know, do it as a, uh, a short story, do it as a painting, whatever it might be. Do it as a sculpture trying to illustrate events. There's a million different ways we can explore. And I highly advocate you do so. Uh, thanks very much for words for having me out. Is there anything that, uh, that uh, you want me to say to wrap up or are we okay? Okay, again, thank you very much for, for everybody for having me for words. And uh, congratulations, Awards Festival, for making 10 years. Thanks so much. Uh, congratulations again, Awards. <laughs>